I'm originally from Texas. I grew up in a really small town outside of Houston called Sweeney. And um, then I moved to San Antonio, went to college, and met my husband there. And then we moved to Austin, because he's a songwriter. And then um, Austin wasn't in the place for him to be, and Nashville is more of a music town, so that's why we moved to Nashville. He's been here for five years. I moved um, a year after he moved, because we originally had two babies under two, and there's no way I could have moved to Nashville by myself without knowing anyone, not knowing where to live. So I moved in with my parents for a year, and he lived here for a year until we knew exactly what area we wanted to live in. And I hear you just bought some land. Tell me about that. Yeah, we did. So we've been looking since July. I guess after COVID hit, we realized we needed to, um, I don't know, just have some land in case something did happen in Nashville and get out of town. And uh, we've been looking since July and we found something, I guess in January, just recently. And um, it's 10 acres and it has water on it. It's really beautiful. Don't really have a plan plan, but um, I guess long term we would like to build a house, have a music studio for him or like a writer's retreat like on the water so he can have music retreats there and then um, have a big garden. I would like to have some animals. We already have chickens but I want to get some goats, sheep, maybe a cow or two but let's just start with the goat and sheep first. So why did you start with chickens? Well they're smaller and they're more manageable I guess. Um, I guess that's the main reason. Will you tell me a little bit about like your um, landlord and how you approach your landlord about the chickens and your name oh, and all that? Oh yeah, so um, I guess I just called her up uh, and I asked her if we could have chickens in the backyard and she was like, chickens? And she was really surprised about what I was asking her. And she said, um, well, yeah, I don't care if you have chickens as long as you take them with you when you leave. And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. I have two girls, Everly is just turned six on Friday and Story is seven, and um, they they go to school, they love it. Um, they're very active in soccer, and you know, soccer, gymnastics, dance. So, they're very active girls. Uh, we play with them. Um, I like to pet them and talk to them and just try to get them used to, you know, being around us. And, um, I don't know. They're just they're just so weird to me. I've never actually like seen something up so close and their fingernails are so long and their hair, I don't know, they're just really weird to me now. But, but do you like them? Yeah, I do like them. Yeah, I want the girls to be more responsible and take care of the chicks and have like, you know, chores every day. I mean, they get up in the morning and go give them water and stuff like that. I mean, the, the bag of food's kind of heavy, so for them right now, but eventually, yeah. I want them to be, you know, be able to do that. That'll be their chore. When COVID hit, they were both um, Everly was still in preschool, so she didn't she didn't get to go anywhere. She just stayed home. And then Story was in school in kindergarten, but we did remote learning. So for about I guess after spring break is when they shut down the school. It was actually it was difficult. She didn't want to listen to us. They were just learning how to read and learning about you know. It was like really important at the end of kindergarten because that's where they really, you know, push reading. And so I feel like um, if she would have been in school, she would have been maybe a little bit more ahead than she is now. It was pretty hard because I had to work, you know, outside the home. And my husband, he's a songwriter, so he needs to work. But he, I mean, he, he can be flexible. So um, it's like me going to work and then coming home and doing school with the girls at night. And it was just kind of difficult. Chickens are great for teaching the kids just responsibility, you know, feeding them, giving them water, cleaning out their cage, giving, you know, giving them new pine um, that you have to put in the bottom of their coop. And just, you know, they're very gentle with them. I was very worried about them, like, being a little rough. As soon as they saw them in the post office, they already had Snowflake's name, Courtney's name, I'm trying to think how, and Rose. Everly loves the name Rose, so I had to have a chicken named Rose. I knew they were going to be coming the week of April 19th, but I didn't know what day, and I thought it would probably be Tuesday the next day, the 20th, but they didn't They didn't come the 20th, so on the 21st at like 6.30 before we even got up, they, um, they called and left a voicemail, and they gave me their cell phone number, and they said, hey, call me, because you know, you have chicks here, and you can come pick them up at 8.30 when we open, and I was like, okay, and um, I was like, hey, girls, we'll go pick up the chicks, and I'll take you to school so you can see them, and then they called again at like 7 o'clock, and they said, hey, your chicks are here, and I was like, yes, I know, I'll be there at 8.30 to pick them up, and they said, oh, no, you can come get them now. I think they're hungry. They're, they're really chirping along, and I was like, okay, so we threw our clothes on, and we drove down to the post office and rung the doorbell, and um, 
they brought out a little box with all six of them in and you could hear them as soon as we walked in the door you could hear them chirping. We actually opened them. I wanted the, the lady that was working there to see them because she's like, oh, I you know, sometimes get to see them or she made a comment about seeing them. And I was like, well, let's just go ahead and open the box here. And so we opened them and they were all alive. And um, the girls saw the, the gray and white one and they're like, oh, that's Snowflake. And then they saw uh, the orange one and they're like, oh, that's Flamey. I, was, I thought we were going to name it Flameying, but no, it's Flame E, just E. Last count, I had 150 hens and four roosters. Yeah, and chicks in the brooder. We have a farm just outside of Columbus, Ohio, and we sell eggs from our farm and at the farmer's market. So, and that season will start here in about three more weeks. So we're ramping up. The laying flock is fully ramped up in preparation for on-farm sales and farmer's market sales. So that's what we do with all of those chickens. So I get my chicks from Meyer Hatchery pretty much exclusively. So I come up here once a month to load up my pickup truck with a uh, thousand pounds of feed every four weeks. That's how much feed we go through <laughs> for all of those chickens. I love having them. I really, really do. Like if we got rid of everything else on our farm, I would still have probably about 25 hens just for our family because I just love having them. I love taking care of them in the wintertime, even when it's frozen waters and dealing with the trucking the feed through the snow and all that. I just love having them. So the pandemic changed us almost overnight quite a bit. We noticed even before I knew what was going on with a pandemic, it was just kind of this abstract thing on the news that we were hearing about over in China, et cetera. Um, before it even really hit in the US, we noticed egg sales were immediately like people we had never had come to the farm before were buying from our um, from our farm. And the way we have our farm set up, it's self-serve and it has been for several years. So even before this whole pandemic thing started where we did online orders and pick up, you know, drive through kind of thing, we were already kind of doing that. So people already knew that we had a steady um, handful of customers that would come to the farm and buy their eggs and it was self-serve just to have a little mini fridge on our front porch and that was working great and it still was working great um, but we noticed almost immediately that people were coming that we had never seen before and they were buying all the eggs we had in the fridge and we were like what's going on I just sold 12 dozen like that and so we're like what's going on and then you know COVID started becoming a real thing in the United States and it just kept doing that. And so uh, it did that for all of 2020, starting about early March when Ohio kind of started, you know, locking things down. So we noticed immediately there was something going on with local food and people wanting to find it. The grocery stores were starting to be empty and they knew we have to go to other sources here. So we were one of those other sources that they hit fast and hard. I think the pandemic has kind of helped a lot of people realize where their food does come from and that it's not just like it doesn't start at the grocery store, like it ends at the grocery store. And so people, I think a lot of them have opened their eyes to where their food is actually grown and come from. And, and I think on some level, some people have realized that um, it's not an easy thing to produce food and that you, um, I wish that you know, in March and April, I could have instantly had a hundred more layers ready to go, but it takes time to grow those out and that, you know, eggs don't just happen overnight or even, you know, your, your meat birds don't just happen overnight. Like there's, you have to plan and prepare for that. And your food doesn't, you know, your lettuce in the field doesn't grow overnight. Like it, there's a process involved and in that we can't, the supply and the demand has to always balance each other. Um, and if one of them's out of whack, like demand was out of whack and supply wasn't there. So because it takes some, it takes some forethought and some preparation to produce that. The COVID incident was unreal for the chicken industry. It went from being kind of the side hobby for a lot of people to something people depended on. And so it's just like chicken keeping itself escalated quickly from people just looking for a few pretty chickens for their backyard to something that could potentially sustain them and their families. So we talked to everyone. I mean, I've talked to people in upstate New York who were looking for family pets. 
uh, weren't really sure about birds in general. They had a lot of questions. They knew they wanted chicks, but didn't know anything about brooding. And so it was really just walking them through that process and they were very grateful, but it was funny to see them so ignorant to chicken keeping and just diving, you know, head first into the activity. Um, and I mean, I appreciate it. I love educating people on it. And so we just matched up and instantly started a conversation and chickens are so easy for everyone to talk about. So there's endless topics. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there was a lot of people looking at chickens for meat which it can be a touchy subject for some people. I know a lot of them do raise them as pets, so thinking that, you know, feast or famine, as a lot of people like to say, that this could potentially become a meal if it got to that point. And so those were a lot of tough conversations of when that happens or if it does happen, what do you have to do? What kind of equipment do you need? And so we really try to provide that education, everything from brooding to processing on your own. So it was really funny because I interviewed Adam Danforth on an episode. He's a master butcher out on the West Coast. And this was right when COVID was starting to happen. And so he had a lot of insight from his side because obviously all of the butchers were packed full. I mean, you could not get your meat birds in to be able to get them processed. So a lot of people were forced to process on their own. And his books are great, his instruction is great. And so we did that episode. And then I had somebody who follows our podcast group on Facebook and they posted a picture a few weeks later of their setup and their birds and they had Adam's book laying out and I talked to him and I said, how did it go? And he's like, great. He's like, your episode saved me. I listened to it four times, had Adam's book on the table, had all my equipment laid out and he successfully did his whole flock of 25 all on his own. And he would have never done that if it wasn't for COVID. We hear a lot about the new chicken keepers and them diving into it, not knowing a lot and tackling it as a family activity and having you know responsibility with their kids, which definitely happened. I heard that more often than not of, you know, we're doing this to entertain our kids because now we're all stuck home as a family. And this is something that we can all do together, which was really big. But then on the other end, you had seasoned chicken keepers who were striving to try to fulfill orders or who ramping up their meat bird production because they were not just feeding themselves, but they were trying to feed their communities. Like you really saw people reach out and go beyond themselves and try to support others, which was tremendous. And the Meyer Mealmaker program did that as well. You saw people adding that a lot more to their order and you heard stories of donating eggs to food banks or donating it to their elderly neighbor. Like they were putting that out to try to support them and their communities fully. Um, the season keepers too, it was interesting because a lot of them, I talked to a lady just a couple of days ago actually who was saying that she had birds and she loved them. They were pets, she raised them for 15 years, but when COVID hit, and the shortages were happening, now it was like, a, what's the word? Kind of like a newfound respect for keeping chickens, right? It was a privilege, that's what she called it, to have chickens and own them because that egg was now so precious because of the shortage that was happening. And so I think season keepers also had kind of this awakening of what kind of responsibility they had within their communities, but also what a privilege it had been to be raising and having that knowledge so many years in advance. So it's funny because when it first started, we joked about how many you know birds were gonna be returned <laughs> because people are doing this as an activity with their family. But really chickens, once you get a few or just see some baby peeps, chicken math is like my favorite topic because it does, it adds up. And then you add new poultry types and then you continue to expand. And so you'll never have the perfect coop because you're always making additions. And I see that escalating nationwide. I see a lot of backyard chicken keepers, you know, getting enthusiastic about egg color and trying to experiment with new things or even genetics. I had a podcast episode about genetics and it was funny how many people wrote in and was like, never knew that, like this is fascinating. And so I think it really is an awakening of just what chickens bring to the table. Um, because, you know, a lot of people were talking about getting puppies, but puppies don't make breakfast. They're accessible to every level of person within the economy. I mean, poor, all the way up to the rich, you see the whole spectrum investing in chickens, and I think that's one of the most powerful things. For a lot of us who lived in the country, this was just our normal, everyday life. Like, we didn't really go out a lot. We didn't go to the big box stores. You're used to being self-reliant, and so I think it was just a more of, see this is what can happen like take no like try to be more self-sufficient 
And so I think that was a great time for people to start reaching out and educating others. So we had friends and family who had never taken an interest in anything we did saying, okay, like, how do you do this? And what is that exactly? And do you have a chicken plucker? Because I don't. And so then we had neighbors too that were reaching out and like, are you growing tomatoes? I'm gonna grow peppers. Like what breed of chicken are you raising? So it was that kind of just amongst community where we were talking with other country folk who were doing the same thing, canning. I mean, I know that was a big boom with the pandemic, raising your own animals. And so then it really came into processing your own animals because all of the butchers were full. And so we processed all of our own chickens. We processed all of our own pigs that year. Um, we really stepped outside the box and took a hold of homesteading in a new light. I definitely think it's an undervalued skill set just because everyone's so used to convenience. Even myself, I love to go through a drive through every now and then because I don't want to cook dinner. But when it came down to it, having a freezer full was what, you know, was priority. And so I think a lot more people were doing the victory gardens or gardening in general, adding more produce, adding onto their flock. Like it was not just, it definitely was a chicken boom for us as a hatchery, we witnessed that. But across the board, people calling in were telling us what they were doing amongst their homesteads as a whole to make sure that they were prepared. I'm very proud of the fact that I'm one of the original chicken ladies in Nashville. 10 years ago, I took my kids on a field trip. They were seven and nine, and we came home with 12 chicks. We didn't have a coop. We had no plan, but we have 12 chicks. And I was posting pictures on Facebook. I was so proud of my new flock and that we were actually keeping them alive. And then somebody wrote to me on Facebook and said, you know that what you're doing is totally illegal. Like you can't even have chickens in Nashville at all. So luckily for me, there were some other underground chicken keepers who had illegal flocks and we quickly flocked together and um, we started having monthly meetings and we made a cookbook and we lobbied the council to, and they were getting ready to vote on legalizing chickens. And so fast forward to January 2012, we're sitting in the courthouse in the front row, dressed as chickens, and they start voting. And we needed 21 votes. And we get to 20 votes. And this grumpy councilman jumps up and he pulls out a picture of a very ugly chicken coop. And he says, if somebody builds this next door to me, I wouldn't like it, so I am not going to vote for this. And we were crushed. But luckily, council came up with a plan and they said, I think they saw the disappointment in our children's faces and our faces and they said, we will make this work. We're gonna give you one year to prove to Nashville that you can be responsible chicken owners. So we had a sunset clause, we made it, we proved to Nashville that we can do it. And so now 10 years later, we all still have happy flocks in our backyards. My parents bought this farm in 1962 uh, I was like three years old, we moved here, and they had like 80 cows, and it was my, uh, my mom and dad and my three siblings, and uh, so they milked cows here for many years, uh, sold it to my husband and I. We now operate the dairy farm, uh, and we call it it's Falling Star Farm Dairy. We milk about 500 Holsteins right now. Uh, my husband and my son are involved in that with uh, a few employees over there, so. Yes, yeah, so we have the fourth generation growing up on this farm right now. It started as a, basically as a hobby for myself when I had three young children back in 1985. And so my husband uh, met up with a woman who had a, had a small hatchery over in Worcester, Ohio. I became friends with her. She uh, was to the age where she was ready to retire from that and sell off some of her flocks. So uh, we bought a couple of older uh, Peter Syme incubators off of her, uh, put them in a building on another farm where we lived at the time and um, had like two flocks that we started out with, maybe around three or 400 female hens, and um, just started hatching part-time. Uh, I think the first year I hatched about maybe 
five or 600 baby chicks, and then the next year it was like 5,000, and then it kept growing from there. Right now we um, have added on to this building about four times. We have about, well, about 65 employees, and uh, we hatch a little over a million birds a year. So yeah, there, there's been some challenges and a few hiccups along the way, but uh, you know, I've learned a lot too. So I've, I've always, you know, I've really been totally involved with everything that happens here, you know, right down from, you know, you know, the, the flocks and placing the flocks and, and involved in that. And, you know, even the equipment when we buy new hatchers, new setters, I'm very involved with, you know, when that, when those are installed. So um, I think I just, I feel I have a real good knowledge of, you know, what it takes physically to keep things going here, which is kind of more my forte. And then of course we have uh, people on the technical side that take care of all the, all the technical issues as far as, you know, with our website and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, there's, there's been a few, there's been a few challenges, but uh, it, um, I think it makes a person stronger. You know, they say if, uh, you know, if you don't, if you don't get pushed, you're not going to go anywhere, right? <laughs> maybe the last 10 years. It used to be it was more um, probably orders of 25 or more at a time. And a lot of, you know, basic uh, egg layers, you know, pretty much your production type birds. And, um, but then since then, people are more kind of in the backyard mode where they want just a little something for themselves. So we were able to uh, come up with a device, you know, ways that we can ship uh, small quantities. So now our orders are probably more like 10 or less. Uh, so we have special boxes that are made for that. We can put a heat pack in there if the weather's uh, cold, depending on what the, what the weather is in an area. So I would say what we see now is more kind of your backyard, uh, people kind of wanting to do it themselves type of thing. You know, they want to produce their own meat, their own eggs. Um, some people just want them, you know, because birds are beautiful. They uh, have some really great, great colors and different egg color. And, and people sometimes will buy a bird depending on what what the feather pattern is, what the color is, the disposition of the bird, or you know, even what color egg that they lay. So, I mean, sometimes you'll get an order of maybe 10 birds in an order, and it'll be 10 different kinds. You know, they'll want like one of each. <laughs> it normally is, you know, more than one breed. It's, it's probably multiple different breeds in an order instead of just like one order of 25, like maybe Rhode Island Reds or Barred Rock was would be a pretty typical order, I'll say 10 years ago, but now it's, they're very diversified with what they're asking for. What about the pandemic? Like, what happened? I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Well, uh, you know, I guess the first thing was we, you know, here we we thought, you know, what do we what do we do with our people here in the building? You know, we want everybody to be safe. So, a lot of our CSRs then were able to work remotely. Uh, then the store, we had to, uh, of course, we had to close the store, and but we were able to keep the drive-through open. So that was a. Uh, a great learning experience there, a pretty big learning curve, but so when you have maybe, uh, you know, 100 plus orders to be picked up on a Monday, and now they can't walk in the store, but they have to drive through the drive through so we get a big long line of cars, but the, you know, our, our store employees here, uh, you know, they would walk down the line and ask people, you know, what their order is, we'd already have it prepared for them, and so we were found we could be very, very efficient with people just staying right in their car and people were comfortable and, you know, they wanted to stay in their car and we, you know, held our distance with them. I know we gained a lot of new customers. Uh, we would look at, you know, the, uh, the statistics every week because, you know, how many new customers we had. And yeah, we did. We, our customer base uh, grew quite a, quite a great deal. And, you know, we were basically sold out week to week. You know, it was hard for really to take care of some people that wanted some birds, but, you know, we just, we can uh, only produce so much, and so, but we, we sold every bird we had, and people were, were, were happy to have them. You know, we had a lot of great customers, and I think we've really retained, you know, we, want, we hope that in 2021 we could retain, you know, the new customer base that we created in 2020, and so far it looks like people are, are hanging on there. You know, they really, they really uh, found out it's a good, a good investment, good thing to do. Well, Hatch Day starts really about three in the afternoon on Sunday. Uh, that's when we take the birds out of the hatchers, sort them out uh, into, into plastic baskets, and then those go to the, to the sexers. They start that about three in the afternoon on, on Sunday. Uh, they process all of that. They're usually done like about 4 a.m. on Monday. Uh, the, the crew, the shipping department, then they come in and they start packing orders about 3 a.m. on Monday. Uh, we had about 1,400 orders today that they needed to be packed and ready to go and out the door by 
uh, by four o'clock this afternoon. So, and I think they're pretty well through everything right now. Just about ready to head to the post office. And then, of course, we have our pickup orders. Um, we probably had, you know, 130 or 40 pickup orders for today also. So the store is always very busy. A lot, of, a lot of foot traffic, a lot of drive-through traffic on Monday also. Everybody gets excited, you know, for uh, Sunday when we pull the hatch because the chicks hatch really nice, you know, and it's so, so enjoyable to pull, you know, really nice healthy birds, um, you know, and have all the, the inventory that we need to pack the orders that we plan for. And then, uh, you know, the store, the ladies always like Sunday. They just think that's a great day because they get to see all the customers and people coming in and Everything's just, you know, a lot, a lot of good excitement on Mondays for everybody. What does a good hatch look like? Oh, you know, just great, nice, fluffy chicks. Uh, you know, when you have a good hatch, it, everything just feels great. What's it look like? There you go, beautiful little baby chicks in a basket. And then, then, you, then you pack them up in the boxes and they go out the door, yeah. Okay, so everybody remembers the great toilet paper shortage of 2020. Well, it was like that with chicks too, because once stores started putting limits on how many uh, dozen eggs you could purchase or how many gallons of milk, all those staples, people were like, well, where can I go to get it? Where else can I go? And that's where it was like, it gave new meaning to shop no local or support your local farmer. It wasn't just a saying, it was, this is what we need to do in order to get what we want for our family. So in turn, they were seeking out oh, well, maybe if I go to the hatchery and I pick up chicks, then we can grow our own eggs, <laughs> in theory. Um, and many, for many, it was a learning curve. They didn't do a lot of research before getting them. They didn't realize that there was a time period they would have to wait before they would actually reap the benefits of getting eggs. Um, but that's where we came in. You know, we're more than just a poultry sales company. We give the whole experience. We're gonna help you learn what you need before you need it. You're gonna get also your poultry, what you want to fit your needs. And then before your chicks arrive, you're also gonna get more information. Okay, well, what do I expect? What do I need to have prepared? for when they arrive to, get, to make myself successful. And then once they get their chicks, they can also reach out. Do I need to switch their feed? Can I put them outside? Can I feed them treats? That's a big question. When can I give my chickens treats? Um, so it's start to finish. They're getting the whole experience. We're gonna support you from day one till the end. So a lot of people were looking for already laying chickens. And normally that's, you know, there's a big need for that. Everybody wants a chicken that's already laying eggs. Um, and those are the first to go and they're hard to come by. Um, so what's the second best thing? Chicks. So, you know, then we would introduce them to the process of raising chicks. And many times these are families wanting to raise chicks with their kids. Now that they're home, it's an extra project to do. And ideally it's best to start with chicks because they're gonna be socialized. They're gonna be used to your kids. They're gonna, your kids are gonna be used to them to where they grow up and they're not gonna be running from them. They're gonna be friendly chickens and they're gonna be what that idea is of going to the chicken coop, the chickens running, you collecting the eggs and it's a friendly hunky-dory situation. We offer the Meyer Meal Maker program which is a free chick of our choosing um, that we provide to the customers in hopes that they'll either donate the eggs or the meat, depending on what type of chicken it is, to somebody in need. And during the pandemic, that was big. It's a, already a fantastic program, but during the pandemic, that allowed people who were in need to also help others in need which was big. Many kids were affected with 4-H. A lot of shows were canceled last year. So our team came up with a fantastic plan and we did a virtual poultry show. And we did it for several months during the summer um, because we knew that you know kids all throughout the country raise birds at different stages depending on when their fairs are. So we would have you know a fair for June and a fair for July and a fair for August. And we had one of the members from the Ohio National Poultry Show do the judging for us so the kids could win ribbons and certificates and actually be judged by a professional judge and so it gave them something to still look forward to and it wasn't such you know I can't show my birds it gave them that opportunity their hard work would pay off and we wanted to honor that because we fully support kids in poultry that's the future of agriculture um, that's the future of our food really oh we have
had so many people just so excited. We got a lot of thank yous. Thank you so much. My my child was so disappointed when our fair was um, canceled or the show was canceled. This just made their day. They had so much fun trying to get the perfect shot for their submission. Um, and then when the kids started receiving their prizes, we got a lot of photos like, I got my prize. And we were posting them on social media, just giving them that spotlight that they truly deserve. Because as a 4-H mom, I know how much work goes into those projects, blood, sweat, and tears from the kids and the parents. It's just as much work for the parents. I think there was a newfound respect for the small backyard poultry owner, um, a newfound respect for where your food comes from. For those that dove into raising poultry after not knowing anything about it, you know, they have this newfound respect for the whole process. My hope is that that continues. I think it's so important. It's the biggest life lesson. You know, where does your food come from? How was it raised? Um, there's nothing more rewarding than, you know, start to finish knowing where that egg is coming from and, and hand picking it out of the coop and cooking it for breakfast. Um, I, I really hope that that momentum stays. Um, I hope that we continue to, to support farmers and small backyard um, flock owners. Um, you know, for a long time, they're kind of in the background. And I, you know, I think people now realize how important they are. We kind of, they were deemed essential and essential for a reason. We think of large families, a limit of two dozen eggs, that's like two breakfasts. And when you have a large family, that's not enough. And that's multiple trips to the grocery store and more money and gas. And if you're unemployed during the pandemic, that's really hard. So if we can give them the education and the support to successfully raise them themselves to where that doesn't happen again, then the goal is met. I think for kids especially, going to pick up chicks or receiving chicks in the mail, that's like the most exciting thing. That's better than Santa Claus, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, so we had um, six chicks when we, I guess in the middle of April, we got six chicks. And then um, they got bigger and it got warmer and so it was time for them to go outside. And so the first night we put them outside, we put the heater out there just to make sure they stayed warm. I mean, it was still warm, but we were just, I'm just a little paranoid. And um, so we put the heater out and the next morning one of them was gone. I mean, it was just pieces of it, you know, feathers. I mean, it was it feathers, was, uh, feathers, uh, legs. I mean, there was some intestines and I mean, it was it was the part that broke my heart is the fact that Story had to see it first. And that was her like that was her favorite. And so it was like, oh, my gosh, she was just crying. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. So that's what hurt me the most. It's like, you know, the chicken I can get over, but it's like, oh, just to see their heart break. It's like, oh, I don't know if it was a raccoon or a fox or what it was, but yeah, some, something pulled the biggest one. I mean, we had, you know, they're different sizes and Snowflake was the largest. And, um, and I, I'm assuming Snowflake was sleeping in the corner, you know, cause she was the largest. She wasn't the closest to the heater and it was, she was just gone. I mean, I'm just lucky that they didn't pull all of them. So that was like, okay, we're getting some more. Let's do it. <laughs> that was on a Thursday. So, I mean, but I wasn't thinking five more. So now we have, 10. 10 chickens. When we lost Snowflake after that, I was like, nope, the girls are staying inside until we get the coop done, because I was just, nope, they're staying inside. So they were getting, you know, quite big and quite large. Around eight o'clock each night, they would get on the asphalt and they would just kind of chirp, 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 and wait for us to let them inside. Well then, and, and then Davis would try to, you know, get them inside and they would not go inside for him. They waited, Davis was like, hey, I think they're waiting for you. And I'm like, no, they're not, just get them inside. And he's like, no, I really think they're waiting for you. And I was like, okay, so I, you know, I come down. And sure enough, I come down, I'm like, come on girls, come on. And they, they just, just follow, she's the they rooster. Just, they just follow me inside into their cage, you know, yeah, I mean, into I tried the every way in the world, I was like, I was like, no, they, they they made her the rooster, you know? And, and so, um, you know, we did fun. that. We did that until we finally got the, the coop built. It took about a couple days to get the coop built. You did impulse chicken buying. Tell me about it. What happened? <laughs> yeah. We actually uh, waited a little bit. We no, talked we did it. I guess it was pretty No, good. it was that day. I said, I'm buying them. Oh I'm buying gosh. five more because yeah. we wanted another gray one. <laughs> yeah. It was a really cool looking chicken. I don't even know what kind it was, but we replaced Snowflake with Snowball. So she's another gray one. Story wanted to call her um, Snowflake Two. <laughs> Snowflake Two, and I'm like, that's kind of hard to say. Why don't we try something else? And so we landed on Snowball. Yeah. And uh, so she's like, there better be a gray one because you know when you order them, sometimes you don't know what you're gonna get. 
and there happened to be one gray one it was well like, you okay. can put in the little comments and i just said well oh, we did? lost yeah i put it in there okay, i said well, well we lost a gray one if you if by chance you have a gray one we would love so we lost it we lost her on thursday and the new ones arrived that next wednesday yeah they had it yeah i think it's just amazing that that I mean, it's just odd. You can just go online, order some chickens, and they show up in a box. It's just, it's wild to me. And it's like, I don't even know who handles that. I guess there's some sort of special. The post office freight. called again at I mean, 7 in the morning. After we picked up the baby chicks um, from the post office that day, um, I took them to the, the girls' school. The kids were so gentle with them. I was very surprised, you know, because, I mean, you hear of horror stories, you know, the ba kids have to be really careful of the babies because, you know, they're, yeah. they could, you know, squish them or drop them or whatever and they were really gentle and I mean even the boys were just talking to them they each had their own favorite and they they, they were saying oh yeah they're running they're playing chase because they were in the, like a little cage I brought and the chickens were running back and forth and they just thought it was the coolest thing ever so I've noticed there's a lot of kids that don't really get interaction with animals like they, they not even a dog or anything it's like and like it's just weird to me because you know I grew up with animals and I don't Everybody I know pretty much had animals, but there's a lot of people that, that haven't. And it's like, I'll see them hold a dog. They have no idea or like, like and it's like, you gotta be kind of careful. It's like, oh wait, you know, they don't really know how the pressure, they don't know, you know, their own strength sometimes. <laughs> I grew up with chickens um, and ducks. And um, I knew one day I would have them again. And I think, you know, just this last year that, you know, some of the things that have happened, you know, we wanted to be a little more self-sufficient and be able to kind of provide for ourselves in case something were to, were to go on. I was like, well, now's the best time. Where did you grow up then? So, uh, a little town, Wimberley, Texas. Um, I mean, we didn't have a stoplight. Lived at the end of a dirt road on a creek in a cabin, rock cabin that my great-grandfather built. And um, we had, you know, chickens. At one point we had coon hounds. I mean, we had pretty much all kinds of animals. We talked about buying land. We actually looked for, I mean, almost a year trying to find something that was within our budget that um, that had come on. We knew we wanted some water. We knew we wanted something that, that had water. And, you know, being from Texas, that you know, anything that has water is, is just so expensive. It's pretty much out of the question. Um, but we noticed in Tennessee, there was, you know, there's a lot more water available. And it's like, okay, we can actually find something. It might be a little outside of Nashville. You know, I wanted the girls to have something that, you know, they can go and just explore. You know, they're not so caged in. and. Um, you know, I kind of had that when I was little. I grew up on a creek, and I mean, one of the best things was just exploring, you know. It's hard because you want to protect your kids, but you don't want them to be so sheltered that they can't, you know, they can't handle the real world in, in, to some degree. And But I feel like land is kind of one of those things where they can explore, and it, it, you know, it has the kind of, almost the illusion of freedom. I mean, it is to some extent, but like, it's a little safer, you know. You gotta watch for snakes, I guess, but. You know, they can build forts, play in the water, you know, just be wild a little bit. How much did the pandemic influence you buying the land? Um, COVID hits and that I think, things? Well, so I think um, it was, it became a little more, um, I guess, what's the word? Urgent? Uh, Urgency? Urgent. Yeah, I, I, felt, I don't know. I felt a little more like we like, need to get it. Let's like, get it now because I don't know what kind of you know potential pandemonium is going to go on in the city. You know, if 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 trucks are not able to get to certain areas to, to provide food, if you know, you just you just don't know what kind of situation. So it's it's good to have something to where you can kind of back away from it for a little while if you had to, you know, a place to go to where you know, if you need to lay low for a little bit, you've got something, you know, it's not such a doomsday mentality. It's just like, hey, you know what? We're gonna have a little spot where if the SHIT hit the fan, then, you know, we can, <laughs> we can- uh, Get out of town for a little bit. Yeah. Do you think the pandemic has made more people here? Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah, I think they're starting to see some of the state's rules and regulations that are uh, a little over the top. You know, I think that uh, it's one thing to, to be safe and, and, you know, to try to protect citizens, but it's another thing to completely control their lives at, at, at all costs. And, and I mean, you have to take into consideration, you know, you know, the pandemic, the, 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 the virus, is, you know, it was a scary thing for a time. And, you know, the, the idea that, you know, there's deaths because of the virus, but there's also deaths because of the regulations of the virus or the rules that, that are being, you know, applied in the economy. You know, it it has an effect all the way around. As far as as 
you know, people out of work, you know, people that can't work, people that can't work can't provide food for their family. They can't, you know, do things. There's, I mean, the suicide count went way up. I mean, there was a Alcohol lot of Alcohol count, the child abuse. I mean, yeah, children are home violence. More. I mean, there was a lot of things that, that um, and I mean, it wasn't just, you know, some of this stuff was, was you know, not just hearsay. I mean, we, we know personal connections to things that, you know, we've, we've heard these stories. We weren't fearful through the whole thing. Um, we didn't, we didn't move on fear. Um, and I think a lot of people did, and that caused a lot of craziness, you know, when, when, um, and the media didn't help because it, this is the worst thing that ever happened to, you know, humankind. And, you know, it's just, it, it just, yeah, they didn't help matters, you know, um, instead of kind of consoling people and saying, okay, we've got something, we're going to take care of it. But instead it was like, you know, you're going to die, you know, and, and, you know, luckily I didn't buy all of it. You know, people did lose their lives, but, you know, um, we didn't let fear take over. You know, we just started looking at the bigger picture and, and kind of bird's eye view and, and, you know, how can we, how can we separate ourselves from this kind of situation? Well, we don't, don't depend on the system as much, you know, so try to be a little more self-sufficient. If we lost our jobs tomorrow, how could we do that? Are we just going to be begging in the streets or are we going to be able to provide? And, and that's really what I think a lot of people should look into because you don't need, you don't need a lot of land, you don't need a lot of things. I mean, we, we take everything so much for granted that we're just going to go to the store and it's going to be there. And I mean, we saw just with a little bit of scare, you know, how the, the shelves paper. Are just emptied. <laughs> and I mean, if you cut the trucks off, I mean, you know, people should realize where their food's coming from and, you and know, what's in the and food. God forbid if something happened to the big farms that, that produce the food, you know, and, and I mean, just, just all kinds of things. And, and I mean, you want to, you want to kind of hedge that. You just, we just had that thought and some people just aren't in a position to do it anyway. And I mean, we just put ourselves, we made ourselves be in a position to do it. You know, we just said, we want something. And again, like you said, it's not like, you know, um, kind of the doomsday prepper thing, you know, where, where it's like, okay, the world's ending, we're gonna go live in a bunker. But, um, you know, everybody should have, I mean, we have insurance for everything, right? Why not food? And then chickens, when do chickens come into the conversation? Well, I guess Story's always wanted a bird. I mean, I think, I mean, I, again, like I always, I knew I was gonna have chickens at some point, because, you know, I wanted animals. You know, we talked about having animals, and like, hey, let's have a farm, and let's have animals, and that'd yeah. be cool, and goats, and, goats and you know, uh, pigs, but you know, my problem is I, I, I don't want to kill the animals. It's like I want to, you know, I'll <laughs> goats for milk or something, you know, to clean up the area. But I, I have a hard time, you know, and and it's kind of hypocritical because it's like you know I'll buy meat at the store, but I would hate to have to do it yourself. Do it I don't myself. Know. Like I'm, I'm. That's just something. Still kind of working that out. I'm like, are we supposed to eat meat? You know, like <laughs> I, I play with that in my head sometimes. You know, we're renting this place, and it's like. You know, are we allowed to have it here? You know, are we allowed to have chickens? And I thought, no way, you know, like there's no way. And then like, she said, oh yeah, the guy down the street has chickens. Like, really? And I think that was the real. Yeah. If he, the, if he can do it, then, you know, yeah, let's ask like, the well, landlord let's, if let's, she'll let's let us have it. chicks. And and one of my songwriting friends. Oh yeah, Johnny. He ended up during the, the COVID thing. He just kind of hung out in Kentucky with, with his significant other. And they, uh, they just kind of laid low and, and they had chickens. And, and they ducks. were just, yeah, chickens and ducks. and. He said he never knew he could love a duck, <laughs> and so he fell in love with a duck. With COVID around, we were like, we stayed home, we played games. Yeah, we it was were a lot more, more family, family oriented. unit. I mean, and like, I think, uh, that was and we weren't thing. running around going to, you know, soccer games and gymnastics, and we were just home, you know. We were, we were, you, you get to really appreciate the whole family unit because it's like you get some time together. You're not, you know, because. I mean, we live in a, in a society now where both parties pretty much have to work and we're kind of, in a sense, institutionalizing our kids, you know, whether it's daycare or whether it's after, you know, whatever it is, we're putting them in all these things and like, we're seeing our kids. I mean, I have friends that see their kids probably total three hours a week. I mean, it's sad, but it's, it's a reality. Now, I just never want to be in that position and money isn't, I, I'm not, I, I'd rather make nothing than and be able to be around my family than, than chase that so hard that I'm sacrificing everything that I hold, you know, near and dear, so. What do you think your girls get from having the experience with the chicks? Responsibility for one. Responsibility, I think there's a, there's a different kind of bond, you know, it's, it's, it's another way to love something, you know, and, and 
it's just seeing them interact with it and, and just talk about them and, and they're really concerned about them. You know, they, I mean, they truly fall in love with these things. And um, it's just, it's cool to see. And I feel like we're outside more. Like we get up in the morning and the first thing we do is come outside and you know we let them out we stay out here for a while and you know and then we're out here in the evenings with them you, you know the chicken song yet? i haven't written the chicken song yet but uh that's gonna be a rager that will probably <laughs> come along come along um you know but but even during the pandemic i mean i probably wrote my best songs you know so far i i think the whole thing was i mean you know it's a blessing and a curse like everything uh but it really did uh it, it, it moves you closer to, you know, uh, I guess it moved me closer to God um, in a lot of ways. And um, not that I wasn't already there, but it really did uh, just, just open my eyes to some things and, and kind of surrender control. You know, we, we spend so much time thinking we're in control of everything and we're, we're, you know, out there just trying to do everything ourselves. And it's like, once you let go, it, it, it tends to um, things things tend to work out better. Kind of crazy situation you waited for all your life. I didn't want to show up, but I did. I knew exactly why when I saw you walking in like a fairy tale princess with a twist. I can't wait for the clock to strike 12 before we kiss each other. Just when you think you've had enough, I'm gonna give you so much more.